Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the conclusion of our five-part Workforce Wednesday briefing mini-series. I'm Dan Bursett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Thanks to everyone who's joined us over the last month and to those online with us today. Of course, today does not mean the end of our coverage of workforce development issues. It is one of the central themes in our efforts to showcase climate change solutions. For one thing, all of the Workforce Wednesday briefing materials, including archived webcasts, presentations, and written summaries are all available at our website, www.eesi.org. And second, we'll continue to write about the need for a clean energy workforce, highlight examples of successful programs around the country, update our jobs fact sheet, and schedule even more briefings, especially next year, to share information about a just transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. The best way, of course, to keep up with everything is to visit us online and sign up to receive our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Last week, we learned about the potential for mass timber to lower emissions and spur good, sustainable jobs. And before that, we covered how leading high school programs are preparing their students for green careers, conservation corps, and the status of a just transition in Western coal country. As with each of the first four Workforce Wednesday panels, I'm so pleased to introduce another outstanding group of entrepreneurs, practitioners, and leaders. It is difficult to exaggerate the importance of small businesses to U.S. prosperity. Since the Great Recession, according to the Small Business Administration, two of, three, two of every three net jobs, net new jobs, are created by small businesses. And yet these same companies that we can really not afford to lose are facing unprecedented challenges since the coronavirus took hold of our country seven months ago. Another thing that is hard to overestimate is the importance, uh, excuse me, another thing that is hard to overestimate the importance of is the transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. A lot of people talk about that topic and sometimes maybe it feels a little abstract, but it is very real. And a lot of the people who actually do the work to make that transition a reality are under a lot of stress right now. And, a, and they're under a lot of stress at a time when we really need them if we aim to make any progress toward lower emissions in the next 10 years. We will hear from three panelists in a few moments about this nexus of small business importance, potential, and opportunity in the context of clean energy and climate resilience, and how these innovative community-sustaining companies are currently under severe pressure from the economic fallout of the ongoing pandemic. And of course, we will hear about what we can do about it to position them for a post-coronavirus recovery. Now on to our briefing. First, some final logistics. After our final panelists, we will have time for questions from our online audience. If you have a question, please follow EESI on Twitter, at EESI online, and send in your questions that way. You can also send us an email uh, to EESI at EESI.org. And now, let me introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Leticia Colon de Mejaez. She is a nationally award-winning building scientist and climate equity speaker. She is the founder of the nationally awarded company, Energy Efficiency Solutions, chair of the nonprofit Efficiency for All, policy co-chair of the National Building Performance Association, a commissioner for the State of Connecticut Commission on Women, Children, Elderly, Latino, and Puerto Rican Affairs, and founder and president of Green Eco Warriors. Leticia is an awarded and published children in a leadership, sustainability, as well as a line of educational science-based graphic texts like comic books that feature a cast of diverse superheroes in a line with national science standards. Leticia, welcome to our briefing today. I really can't wait to hear your presentation. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Just give me one moment and I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, um, and move forward. Great. Are you able to see the screen? Phenomenal. Excellent. Okay, so energy efficiency is the most low cost way to lower the burden on our 
energy grids all across uh, the United States. In addition to lowering our demand for electricity on larger grids, it also lowers the demand for heating and cooling, closing the affordability gap for families all across the nation and lowering carbon emissions um, and environmental impacts as well at the same time. It also provides a lot of jobs. And so that's really what I'd like to talk about today. So building a scaled green workforce to support small businesses and improve America's buildings at the same time is what I will be focused on. So energy efficiency in America prior to the pandemic, there were more than 2.3 million Americans working in efficiency in 2018. It was the largest and fastest growing job sector in the energy industry, representing over a quarter of all energy jobs with a projected growth rate of almost 8% for 2019. There were over 79% of the companies were small businesses. This is important to know because small businesses hire local people um, and employ and uh, directly from their communities quite often um, developing in some supporting local economic um, development. Across the country, there's virtually jobs in every single uh, state in the United States. I like to say, if you have buildings with a B, you probably have energy efficiency jobs as well. Um, beyond this, uh, over 317,000 people uh, work in energy efficiency jobs. Um, with, and um, over 1 million plus energy efficiency jobs outside of most um, cities as well. But again, it's very important to understand that these jobs are not just available in cities. These jobs are available anywhere that there's a building. So what, what's going on now? So COVID impacts on jobs, and we're seeing this with a lot of industries, but in the energy efficiency industry where we work in homes and buildings where people live, work, and play, um, we have experienced shutdowns all across the nation. Cumulatively, we've lost over 300,000 energy efficiency jobs. Um, the job recoveries stalled, even though some states have been opened, because the concerns about the pandemic are real, and often people are not ready to have folks going into their home um, and providing these services, which would help close the energy burdens um, in their homes and buildings across America. Over 40 states have double-digit employment numbers in the energy efficiency stackers right now. I myself had to lay off my entire staff for um, almost a five-month shutdown in my state. So um, here we have a link to report if people want to take a look at that later as well. I think it's important to go back and read some of these things. So what can we do? Yes, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we need to get our um, economy stimulated again. So energy efficiency could be part of this job uh, stimulus package. It would be one of the number one ways to stimulate jobs all across the United States because again, anywhere you have buildings and, and energy demand is a place that you can employ energy efficiency to lower that demand and close that affordability gap. The new report on energy efficiency stimulus to jumpstart America's economic recovery is available, build back better faster. Um, if Congress appropriated $60 billion, some highlights from this report, which I found really fascinating, $60 billion for an efficiency sector would add $254 billion to the U.S. economy and create almost 800,000 full-time jobs. Um, in my state alone, we have 34,000 energy efficiency jobs prior to COVID. Again, that number is extremely decreased. Right now, as our um, area is looking to build up and hire, one of the things we're experiencing is a lack of ability to hire skilled labor. So I will talk a little bit about that. So economic development that works. Um, Energy Efficiency Solutions is the company that I have. Currently, uh, we employ 22 people who were underemployed or unemployed when we uh, met them. We've trained over 120 people for local workforce opportunities, and we would love to train more, which is why I'll talk a little bit about policies that could support that happening on a national scale. These are long-term career paths from entry-level jobs like insulation support technicians and um, guys that you know set up lower doors to higher level building scientists, architects, office managers. Um, people sometimes don't realize that there are more than direct installers that work in energy efficiency. And there's a great array of careers and roles that people can grow into. As we grow energy efficiency in our nation, we will grow local jobs. If your town has buildings with a B, then this is something for you to be excited about. Um, what can we do? How can we make this work? And how can we get this economy going? First of all, one of the areas that I see that's lacking is a lack of Department of Labor codes, which acknowledge energy efficiency careers. Having um, codes that acknowledge those careers are important because when workforce boards are doing their planning, they really do use those codes. Additionally, that is often how funds are allocated based on workforce codes and how training programs are developed. 
it's important that we recognize the benefits that energy efficiency offers, not just our economy, but our energy grid and our society overall, as well as our health um, and, and the impacts that it has to lower the damages of climate change. We can create funding sources to train the growing workforce because there is a lack of trained workforce and there's a lack of knowledge on this growing industry. All of these folks that are unemployed and need to get back to work would probably benefit from understanding the value and importance and that there's jobs available now. So what can we do? These are some legislation pieces that could be acted on right away. Hope for Homes um, Act 2020 is a bipartisan bill which recently passed the House. Um, this online performance-based efficiency would offer $500 million in training and immediate support for small businesses, as well as equitable access to training, including online training that would be in support during the pandemic, for example. There are grants for provider organizations to help develop the training curriculums, which are very important as our industry changes to respond to the impacts of COVID. We need to update our curriculums and be prepared to go forward. This provides up to $10,000 for contracting employees to cover training costs of rehired or reach or to retain um, employees. That's also important because we've had a lot of difficulty during COVID retaining employees during shutdowns. $1,000 stipend for contractors who complete the HOPE training as well. Um, it also includes a rebate program. This is important to spur, to spur um, the economics beyond jobs. So in order to keep people employed, we need people to buy into products and services. And these are products and services that are not just um, something out there for nothing. Again, these are going to help people all across the United States save money and energy and lower their energy burdens. There's workforce grants for small businesses as well. This happens to be my favorite piece of legislation. Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Act would establish an energy workforce grant program to assist businesses in seeking to educate and train new hires as well as existing employees. So oftentimes we move people up from within and that's really great because it opens up new opportunities to hire from below while pushing people forward in their careers and, and um, bettering their lives. Similar legislation are, is the Clean Energy Jobs Act of 2019, which is also a grant support program to support on-the-job training and efficiency and renewable energy. Again, on-the-job training is really critical for our industry because many of these things are hands-on and technical skills. There's an American Energy Innovation Act, which includes a similar workforce grant program, and the grant Green Neighborhoods Act of 2020, which is a grant for training um, via registered apprenticeship programs. So that's another area that we really could use work on in energy efficiency. Once we get our DLL codes aligned, we need to be working to develop pipelines, such as energy efficiency apprenticeship programs. Other policy opportunities to expand energy efficiency are the Weatherization Enhancement and Local Efficiency Investment Act. Um, this would reauthorize the DOE weatherization program, which often works in line with energy efficiency programs in, in states across America. Um, robust appropriations for these programs allow people to hire and keep our economy going. In addition to that, these programs do serve a lot of folks that are at risk in vulnerable populations, underrepresented in low income populations um, through the state energy programs and the building technology office. And so it is important to consider equity when we're talking about our future and our economy. The last thing I want to say on that is that oftentimes when we're working in communities that are at risk and disadvantage and they learn about these services and there are workforce programs available, we can hire right from those local communities, train them and provide them beyond just energy savings an opportunity to provide sustainable income for their families going forward. In my specific case of my staff, um, we had many staff that came through jobs funnel programs who um, now own homes, own cars, um, her kids are enrolled in college and things of that nature that would not have been an opportunity without um, this type of longstanding career that has growth opportunities embedded in that as well. We, in my case, also out of our 22 employees, uh, 20 of us are minorities and we are a women minority owned business, which I think really does open up um, the conversation to show that um, this growing career opportunity really could enhance and engage communities of color um, and vulnerable populations as well. Uh, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I love energy efficiency and uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, the jobs is, is a big one, obviously. And um, you mentioned a report on one of your slides um, from E2 and E for the future. Um, that report is, um, is epic. Um, I think if I can make a recommendation to those in our audience right now, or maybe people who are watching us later on, um, sort of on our archive, finish this, watch all the way through to 115, it's gonna be fabulous, and then go download that report and read it. 
um, not just to, because it's so authoritative, um, but it really puts um, the, the size and the scale of the opportunity um, in um, very accessible terms. And then um, think about how we can get back to that um, because, um, like you said, we are we're, we're it's it's rough out there right now for a lot of these uh, energy efficiency small business companies. So um, you never go past that report without making a strong plug for it. Um, if you have questions based on what you just heard in our online audience, just as a quick reminder, uh, there are two ways that you can ask them. One is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our second panelist. Stuart Davies is the Chief Executive Officer of Ocean Renewable Power Company. Stuart's focus is on driving growth and profitability at ORPC through overseeing the commercial rollout of a company's demonstrated and proven technology in the United States, and Canada, and Chile. Stuart comes to ORPC with nearly two decades of experience at Sincadia um, Investors, Advisors, excuse me. I, I write this and then can't read it, sorry. Where he served in many different roles, including the Chief Investment Officer of Opportunistic Credit and Portfolio Manager. During his tenure, Stuart served as a director or an observer on boards of dozens of companies in the energy, manufacturing, food, consumer product, retail, in packaging industries. Stuart, thank you so much for joining us today and bringing all of your experience and expertise to our panel. Dan, thanks for that introduction. And I wanna thank uh, Anna, Amber, and Amari for, and the rest of the ESI staff for uh, inviting me uh, here today. Um, I'm gonna leave my video off because I'm already on, we had a storm come through last night and I'm already on plan B, but I'm hoping you can hear me okay and uh, see the slides. So, um, with that, um, just from a background standpoint, um, <clears throat> obviously during last night's debate and in conversations over the last six to 12 months, there's been a lot of discussion about the United States getting to 100% renewable energy and uh, by 2030 or 2035. And about a month ago, uh, I attended a conference um, where the CEOs, the leading CEOs from the wind, solar, and hydropower industries forecasted where they thought their industries would get to, even assuming um, some pretty aggressive numbers around battery storage. And they thought they could just get to 50% of electricity generation. So this isn't addressing transportation and industrial uses as well. Um, and the challenge, wind and solar are great renewable technologies, but, but the challenge is um, they can't fully replace baseload power. Um, and we believe that river and tidal resources, what the Department of Energy calls marine and hydrokinetic or MHK, can be a potential solution for that. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And that's what ORPC uh, provides. Um, one of the first criticisms that I often hear about um, MHK is its high cost. And I, I think um, both wind and solar both suffered from that for over the, over the, the 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. And as you look at the charts on the left, you can see both of those industries as they installed more devices, their manufacturing uh, partners were able to design engineering changes, make improvements, lower costs, installation costs, development costs all came down, which enabled them to both, both wind and solar to come rapidly down the cost curve to where um, you know, they're at five to 10 cents a kilowatt hour and, and some of the lowest cost energy that are, are is provided to the grid today. Um, the chart on the right is what, where we think we can get to. We think we can get to 20 cents in three years. And that's a combination of us making engineering improvements on our design, but also getting cost reductions from putting devices in the water and then operational efficiencies from standing up a supply chain. I'm gonna play a short video. The video that you're watching is ORPC's RibGen power system, which is currently operating in Igiagig, Alaska, a remote community about 250 miles west of Anchorage. Um, the RivGen Power System been operating there for the past 10 months. It has survived a brutal Alaska winter with temperatures as low as negative 40 degrees. Um, it has also survived the breakup of about two and a half feet of lake ice and which flowed over the top of our device. And it has been providing power, reliable baseload renewable energy 
on a daily basis to the community of Igiagic. Um, one reason I love this video is there is no sound as MHK is quiet. It moves with the flow of the river. Um, MHK, is, it, our device is also underwater, so it has no land use issues. And as you can see, it doesn't block up the river. So it has low environmental impact. <clears throat> our project in Igiagig, um, we feel could be a model for fu the future uses of microgrid. Um, this project is funded in part by grants to the community by the US Department of Energy, and it involves us installing two of our RibGen devices, a smart microgrid control and an energy storage system. When fully installed by next summer, it will reduce diesel use by the community of Igiagig by roughly 90% and dramatically cut their CO2 emissions. Um, remote communities in Alaska are an important first market for us. As you can see, all of the red dots are communities that pay over 50 cents a kilowatt hour, which is five to 10 times the, the amount that you or I would pay on the grid. Also, Leticia talked in her comments about uh, energy equality. Um, these communities on average um, use about half of the electricity that the average American does due to the constraints put on the system from both high cost and lack of supply. Um, as you can see, many of these communities in Alaska are located on rivers, which are the lines in blue, as well as tidal locations where there's attractive tidal resources. So we think this is a great opportunity to not only uh, to prove our technology, but also bring uh, renewable energy and lower cost energy to these remote communities. Um, we also often get the question of what, you know, what is the opportunity in the, in the lower 48? Um, and when we start talking about various rivers, um, it's always hard for people from a mental standpoint. They all have this mental map of more of highways and, and state boundaries. Obviously, with the debate last night and uh, the audience on this call um, and an upcoming election, many of the people listening to this today probably have this uh, mental image of the lower 48 map. What ORP sees is a, is a river system, and, the, and the, the river system that are, are highlighted in pink are the fast moving sections of US rivers. As you can see, it covers a lot of this various states in the United States where there's opportunities for deployment. And we believe overall this potential, there's between river and tidal, there's the potential resource to provide power to about 100 million people in the US. In addition, um, developing this industry, there's an opportunity to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in three areas. The first on the left is in remote communities. We have designed our systems to enable uh, local workers, uh, local marine uh, and boat operators to provide, uh, to provide services to us, both during installation and an ongoing maintenance operation. So it's, it's permanent local jobs for these remote communities. Second, if you think about tidal and river in the lower 48, the marine industry would be involved. And so, um, you know, we would create jobs there. And finally, if you think about U.S. manufacturing, a lot of our component parts, as you can see in the pictures on the right, look like uh, agricultural equipment parts. They look like truck parts. They look like things that would go into the oil and gas industry. So they can be made by U.S. companies, a lot of whom are suffering right now in, in, during COVID. In addition, they can also get a boost from the export opportunity potential here. If we just look at remote communities in Alaska, Chile, and Canada, it's about a $15 billion market. It's about half a million people. They're located near robust tidal and river resources, and they pay more than 40 cents a kilowatt hour um, <clears throat> for their power. Worldwide, there's about 1.5 billion people um, who either about half of those have no electricity at all, and about half get their electricity from diesel power generation. And we think the market to provide power to these communities is about 250 billion. There's obviously, there's obviously competition out there, and the EU sees marine and hydrokinetics as a great job creating potential. And they have decided to allocate 670 million euros over the next five years to dominate the ocean energy industry. If you think about um, wind and solar, most of the components for windmills are made in Europe. That was a specific policy action taken by the EU 
to make sure they stood up the manufacturing supply chain and, and had those jobs in you know, middle class, working class uh, jobs, manufacturing jobs in the, in, in the EU. And what they are forecasting is by 2050 that this, will, this industry will create 400,000 jobs in Europe, 53 billion in annual revenue, and about 10%, provide about 10% of the electricity to the European Union. And these policies are focused on putting devices in the water so that, as I mentioned earlier, so they can you can create supply chains and drive down manufacturing costs and come down that cost curve that we've seen with wind and solar. So what can the U.S. do in response and what can, what can Congress do? Well, I think there are uh, three policies and, um, you know, as a, as a, as a, Example, wind and solar received about 75 billion in subsidies over the last 10 years, which created about half a million jobs. We at ORPC believe the MHK industry could, could get a boost with a fraction of that amount, as long as it's focused in three areas. The first is to provide direct funding to remote communities um, and rural communities. Um, not only would this create jobs in those um, communities, but it would also um, by enabling them to, to buy and test devices, um, it would again help us to prove out our technology. <clears throat> it would also help set up regulatory policies that would reduce the time the, and increase the speed of adoption of these, of these, of these projects um, and obviously provide lower cost power to these communities. Second, um, Title 17 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 needs to be amended. If you look at the loan program under that, marine and hydrokinetics perfectly fits the four criteria, but the, co the cost to the, the program is designed for, um, it's, it's got 25 billion left and it's designed for, for projects over $150 million because the minimum cost to get approval is one and a half million. This clearly doesn't work for smaller projects like we would work on in these remote communities and rural communities where they're two to 10 million in size. So we would recommend that the Title 17 be amended to create a $500 million basket for projects from two to 10 million that have lower approval costs. <clears throat> Finally, I know there's a debate about investment tax credits and opportunity zones and whether those policies sh should continue. We believe they should. And, and to make sure under those policies that MHK gets treated the same as solar and wind. We believe that once our technology proves out, many of the rural communities and remote communities that would adopt our technology early on that, on that adoption curve um, fit into both the opportunity zones and if they had investment tax credits available as well, would really drive um, equity capital um, to, to help spur these investments and accelerate the adoption in, in the US. With that, again, I wanna thank you for your time and I'll be available after, after for questions. Great, thank you, Stuart, uh, so much for your presentation. Um, and I mentioned our biweekly newsletter uh, a little earlier, Climate Change Solutions. We actually featured a story yesterday in yesterday's issue about um, the hearing that you testified at, the Senate Na Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the hearing that you testified at last week. And so if people, <clears throat> Uh, we'd like to learn a little bit more about the hearing and sort of the overall state of MHK. Um, uh, it's a great, great article, great resource, and um, uh, lots of great information in the testimony from Stuart, but also the other witnesses that were there um, before ENR last week. Um, one, another quick reminder, if you have questions for uh, any of our panelists today, um, uh, the best way you can ask them a question is by uh, sending us a question on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And now I get to introduce our third panelist. Uh, Jessica Cahale is a project manager at Azavia, where she applies more than 13 years of experience in nonprofit and technical project management. Her recent, pro her recent products include Temperate, a decision support climate change adaptation tool that began as a small business innovation research project for the US Department of Energy and Groundwork, a labeling application designed specifically to build machine learning training data sets for geospatial imagery. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this has been a fantastic learning experience for me and I'm very excited to see where this conversation goes. If you give me just a second, I will share my screen. 
And what I would say first off is it's not going to take long for the audience to realize that our experience as a small business is slightly different than the other two panelists, which has been really fascinating. Uh, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, I can convince you that uh, small business technology firms like Azavia have a role in moving us towards a greener economy. So I work for a firm called Azavia and uh, we do a lot of uh, investment in research and development. And part of the way that we do that is by going after grants that a number of federal agencies uh, put forward. They're called Small Business and Innovation Research Grants. And we and a number of other small businesses uh, that we can name offhand have supported their businesses over the years through these grant programs. So I'm here to talk about that a little bit. A little bit about Xavier. We're a 50 person small business and we're located in Philadelphia. We build technologically advanced solutions for geospatial data visualizations and analysis. Or put another way, we build intuitive web-based applications that showcase a significant amount of data, usually in a number of map layers. Our Jessica, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your slides. Oh, that's not good. Sorry to interrupt. No, absolutely. That is important. It looks like we can see them now, although you're in, we can sort of see the whole thing, not just presentation mode, but it looks great. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, luckily, we didn't uh, go up too far. <laughs> so this was just a little bit about Azavia. This is the important part. So our mission is to advance the state of the art in geospatial technology and apply it for civic, social, and particularly environmental impact. And that's where I really wanna to focus today. We have a number of services that we offer different clients, both in the nonprofit, for-profit and uh, research organization uh, arenas. So mostly we do software engineering and user experience design. More recently, we've done a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence work. And in some cases we can actually serve as uh, an outsourced R&D department. We have a couple areas of expertise in the environmental realms, uh, climate change, conservation, disaster, disaster risk management. Uh, and that stems from a longstanding relationship that we've had with a number of clients around water infrastructure and uh, watershed monitoring and uh, stormwater management. We're also a certified B Corporation, which means though we're a for-profit organization, we have uh, mission and we're mission driven and we have a set of values that we live into with everything that we do. So that enables us to have what we call project selection guidelines that takes us off the table for a number of different things that we don't think will have potential positive impact for the world. So we specifically seek out things that will uh, leave the world a better place uh, than, than it was when we found it. And that's really because our founder and CEO, Robert Cheatham, really does believe in the B Corp ethos, which is using business as a force for good. We really do believe that uh, using technology, and especially now in the last 10 years with the growth of new space and remote sensing, we believe that we are well poised to uh, make these types of technologies accessible to a larger community, which can uh, uh, lift all boats in a sense. One of the ways that we do that is through our own investment in research and development, but also through this uh, grant program that a number of federal agencies offer. It's called the Small Business and Innovation Research Grant Program. Some people call it SIBRS. Uh, we call it SBIR. <laughs> uh, I've heard it both ways, but it is specifically designed for US-based for-profits that have fewer than 500 employees and are controlled and located in the US and are really looking towards uh, focusing on research and development concepts and building out products that can um, further the research agendas of the different agencies. Different agencies will publish on a rolling basis areas of interest that they're looking to fund, but overall across the program, the federal government has identified a set of research and development needs. And these grants help to incentivize the uh, development of those ideas across a large number of organizations, including small businesses and research organizations. And it also incentivizes uh, commercialization of those products and ideas. Usually it is a three phase 
process. Phase one is a concept development. You start with a, a research question or a theory and you spend a bit of time developing that. So that's usually about six months to a year, it depends on the agency that's giving the award. And it's around 50,000 to $250,000. If you're successful at the end of that phase and you are an award in a phase two, that's really when you're uh, building out your prototype, scaling it up and identifying specific commercial applications for the idea. That is a bit longer, it's about 24 months, and it can be, uh, again, depending on the agency, about half a million to $1.5 million. If you're lucky enough to make it past that point, you go into what is called phase three. This is not funded uh, by the SBIR program, but it's basically the commercialization of the concept, the service, the product. And at that point, if it is wildly successful, the federal government can basically option the technology, or it can say, thank you very much, this has been great, we'll keep you on our radar, uh, please go ahead and commercialize it on your own. Xavia has been lucky enough to win a number of these awards over the years, so since 2006 we've won 10 uh, phase one awards, things that have ended in a phase one, so a lot of concepts being developed. A uh, current example in the environmental sphere is we're working on how we might improve flood inundation modeling using synthetic aperture radar and adding that to optical imagery. So it's, uh, it's pretty theoretical, but it's pretty exciting and we're hoping that we can improve flood modeling. We've also had a number of phase twos since 2008. A current example that we're working with is uh, the, thinking through how we might be able to process hyperspectral imagery. The satellites for hyperspectral imagery have not even been launched yet. Uh, and how we might be able to use that to detect oil spills and tree mortality. Those are just two potential applications that we've identified thus far. Over the years, we've been lucky enough to uh, leverage this funding to create five different products. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about the last one, Temperate. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you to all of the organizations that have provided us with some of these funds. Uh, the hyperspectral imagery work that we're working on is funded by NASA and the um, flood inundation modeling that we're working on is currently funded through NOAA. So it's been a really great experience with each of these agencies. No matter which agency, the impact of the award has been um, the same throughout. So we've won roughly $7.5 million between the agencies over the last 15 years. And that has enabled us to support our workforce and specifically engineering positions over the last decade with those funds. And this is just an example of one small business in this realm. So if you multiply that out to all of the small businesses, uh, specifically in the software and technology fields, that's a, a huge impact. In 2019 alone, the research and tools that began as SBIR projects accounted for over 40% of Xavier's revenue. And that's not to say that uh, we didn't need to put in additional R&D investments of our own, we did. However, those concepts were so beneficial to our um, recurring revenue that we've continued to build upon them following the end of the phase two grants or the phase one grants as it were. One of the things that we do as a B Corp, but also just as a technology firm that believes in uh, community, we default to open source. So that means all of the code that we write or most of the code that we write, we put in the public domain and we allow others to use and create derivative works and uh, put it into their own projects. So these projects have led to thousands of lines of open source codes, which has positive impacts for a number of companies and individuals within this realm. And we know this because these people are within our orbit. We talk to them on a regular basis. And this sector, specifically new space and remote sensing, is growing like gangbusters, specifically over the last five years. So everyone that we talk to that's working on this sort of research, either their departments are growing or they've become the head of the departments or they're getting snapped up by new startups and starting new cool concepts. So this, this realm is really booming. Uh, so one of the SBIR projects that we used, that we won, uh, was specifically around making publicly available climate change data 
usable. So uh, the federal government, uh, specifically the USGCRP, has a whole host of climate change indicator information that's available. Uh, it's really unusable for the layperson. However, it is super complicated. Climate modeling has become super complicated over the most recent decades. Uh, the format that it's saved in, called NetCDF, is really hard to wrangle. And if you are not a data scientist or a climatologist in a university department, you can't make heads or tail of it without some sort of interpretation. So we saw that as an opportunity to really take this critical information and make it accessible to the people that actually had to make on the ground decisions about what to what kinds of policy changes were needed in their local communities. So we built Temperate. We uh, call it your adaptation planning companion. And we were lucky enough to win uh, a phase one and two from the Department of Energy and then a phase one from the Department of Agriculture to expand Temperate's reach to rural, hard to reach and tribal communities. We have what we call a bias towards action. So I'm gonna show in just a second how we are contextualizing the climate change data within the types of questions that communities have to answer for themselves. Uh, you can see here, this is our website, temperate.io. Uh, anyone can go and create a free trial and I'll show you just a couple of the things that you'll see when you, when you get there. But just before I do that, uh, background on Temperate, it is a low cost, and when I say low cost, I mean $1,500 a year for any community of any size, um, uh, decision support tool. And it was designed specifically for small to mid-sized communities that have limited planning resources. We're not talking about the New Yorks or the Miamis or the San Franciscos. We're talking about Blacksburg, Virginia, that kind of town. Um, those people may not necessarily have uh, dedicated resources to sustainability. They have generalists more often than not that uh, already wear 10 hats and um, climate change uh, adaptation plans are kind of one more thing that they have to do. So those generalists have to create climate change uh, adaptation plans and vulnerability assessments. And with this tool, they can do so with confidence, knowing that they're using the uh, most authoritative science, but doing so in an accessible way. And we believe that this addresses a workforce capacity issue that is not going to go away. We're not necessarily seeing a huge growth in sustainability officers and departments in local communities. Those communities are already budgetarily strapped. But we are seeing that these communities are coming up with innovative ways to kind of piece together budgets to get the work done. So we're trying to help them do that. And we do that in a number of ways. It's really easy to set up an account. You simply enter in an email address and pick the location that you're interested in. This uh, particular one is for Philadelphia where Xavier is based. And anything that you see in the application after that point is specific to your location. So this is saying specifically that uh, Philadelphia is gonna get a lot hotter. <laughs> it's gonna have more intense rainstorms and see a lot more flooding. And that is kind of the highlight. These are the potential top hazards that people in Philadelphia might want to prioritize. But again, no one knows the community as much as the people working in the community. So we're simply trying to help people prioritize, but not, not making any prescriptive recommendations at all. One of the things that we do is contextualize the climate change data. So in a vulnerable assessment, you'll see that uh, people have to ask themselves questions like, what's the probability of this hazard occurring? How frequent will it be? How intense will it be? And climate science can get you so far, but these questions are things that the community has to answer for itself. We tried to make this simple. One of our users calls this TurboTax for climate change adaptation planning. Uh, so we put the questions front and center, and then you'll see that green bar on the upper right hand corner. Uh, that's where we put the climate data. So these are the questions that you're answering. Here's some data that is specifically related to those questions. And uh, take a look at that, kind of uh, browse the data and help that inform the answers to the questions. We also help to prioritize the actions that might come out of it by doing giving some visual cues. So based on the inputs that the user uh, actually enters, we say, well, uh, anything that comes out is the, uh, the lower, the yellow or the, or the orange, uh, that's probably something that can be backburnered while you deal with higher priority issues, things in the kind of darker orange and the darker red quadrants. And this is all based on the answers that they've provided. 
we're also hoping to accelerate learning by an enabling these communities to share strategies among themselves. So we have a database of over 4,000 strategies taken from across uh, communities across the US. And uh, depending on the geographic area or the specific hazard that a user is looking at, we're able to basically match them and say, here is a strategy that others uh, similar to you have employed previously. Maybe you could look here. So hopefully we don't need to have people reinventing the wheel. We can kind of kickstart the adaptation process. Unfortunately, the impact of COVID means that for most of the communities we work with, which are smaller and uh, less resourced, adaptation work has basically come to a halt. I've been unable to reach some of the people that I've worked with um, because they've been furloughed for a while. So this has really been put on the back burner uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty significantly. Unfortunately, uh, there are a number of people, there's a growing sentiment that COVID really calls into sharp focus how making investments in climate adaptation planning are actually is actually more urgent than ever, specifically for our communities that are at the most risk. Long-term resilience is never something that somebody points to and says, this is what we should be spending our money on, uh, especially in the light of a uh, public health crisis. However, this is an example of how our most at-risk communities are most adversely affected. So we do believe very strongly that investment in this area is what will help us get out of this. And the way that as, uh, companies like Azavia do that is by putting some of our own money behind uh, research and development to bring these accessible tools to people and help them get the work done. But the SBIR funding really, really helps. So it's our hope that SBIR funding can either stay at its current level or ideally be increased so that companies like Azavia can continue to help communities build things like climate resilience. Those funds can help build uh, resilience in all of our communities and we're hoping to help that happen. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much for that presentation. That's really interesting. And um, the issues of climate data, adaptation data, those are critically important and near and dear to ESI's heart. So um, some, some, some nice overlap there between the jobs issue and sort of the kind of information that communities and policymakers and decision makers need to to do right by um, their, their local resilience priorities. So thanks very much for that. And Temperate has a great logo, by the way. It took me a minute to see the thermometer, but then once I did, I, it was it's great. It's wonderful. We, we, we call him Tempe. Tempe, oh, that's good, I like that. He go to Arizona State? <laughs> there have been jokes about that, yes. <laughs> good, I'm, I'm picking up what you're laying down. Uh, one last reminder, if you have questions, uh, there are two ways that you can send them to us. Uh, one is by following us on Twitter at EESI.org. Uh, the other is by sending us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And uh, now it's the time where we'll transition to Q&A. Uh, and I've had the good fortune to introduce three excellent panelists. Now I get to introduce my coworker, Anna McGinn. Anna is with us today. She will be leading our Q&A. And so I will turn it over to her. She is a policy associate with ESI uh, and uh, um, looking forward to the discussion. So Anna, thanks so much. Great, thanks Dan. Um, and thanks to all our panelists today. Really enjoyed all of your presentations. Um, we're just gonna jump right into questions and we have uh, a good amount of time for them today. So feel free uh, people in the audience to continue sending those in as well. Um, so we're going to jump in with our first question, which is going to be on COVID, which I'm sure is on everybody's minds um, as we have this discussion. So if you could speak to how COVID has impacted your business specifically, um, and especially in the case of Leticia and Stuart, what are the steps you're taking to protect the workers as they are either going back to work or perhaps, as Leticia said, joining the workforce for the first time? Um, and also, what kinds of state, federal, or local support would make a difference in um, the work you're doing right now for the workforce and for growing our low carbon economy? Um, so I think maybe we'll start with Stuart and then we can jump to Leticia. Great. So um, we've been, uh, certainly have been impacted by COVID, um, I think in a, a few ways. Um, First, the ability to get out into um, the, to, to visit remote communities to determine if they have adequate uh, river tidal resources to do a project has been basically put on hold. A lot of the remote communities have, have uh, 
put travel restrictions um, on us and our ability to get there. Um, even working with the community of Igiagig, um, you know, typically we would have sent people from our Portland, Maine office to do uh, work on the annual maintenance. Uh, fortunately, we have a couple people who um, work for us at, who are based in Anchorage, Alaska. So they were able to do that work and, and work with the community members to uh, get the maintenance done. So that was a big shift in how we uh, do things. Our supply chain has been disrupted um, in terms of, um, you know, we have an, a couple more devices on order and um, there's been shipping delays or people have been shut down. And so that has caused a, a great deal of disruption. Um, in terms of uh, policies, you know, it's been interesting. A lot of state and federal policy designed around um, companies that have a business that was impacted, but they're not thinking about early stage and high growth businesses in these policies. So for example, you know, a hotel had 50 million in revenues and that's dropped to 10 million in revenues. They can easily calculate the impact of that, and and there's there's um, there's no question that those you know hotels have been you know the travel industry has been hugely impacted, but if you think of businesses like ours, you know we had a plan to 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 grow our workforce thirty five percent. You know we were looking for an, a, a huge increase in growth this year, and still instead of going from you know five to 25, we're going from five to five, but that's not a loss revenue year over year. So we don't qualify for any financial aid from state or federal policies. And I think that's a, um, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, two thirds of the growth in jobs is from small businesses who have a new idea. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an emerging technology or an emerging service. And those are the real engines of growth in terms of hiring and so I think there needs to be a shift in policy, both at the state and federal level to say, okay, we have these fast, fast growing businesses. How do we, how do we treat, how do we help them stay in business? Um, obviously um, PPP helped us. We were able to maintain our staff, but we have not grown our staff at all this year. Thanks so much for bringing up that point. I think that's a distinction that maybe not um, many people have been thinking about. So that's great. Leticia, um, pass it over to you. So um, we had the difficulty in accessing um, PPE equipment. There was a real shortage because healthcare workers needed all the equipment. And in order to do our work, we have to have masks, gloves, um, full gear, really, because we're going into people's homes. Um, so that was a, a real problem for us. Um, same thing, a lot of contractors that we work with were not able to access the PPP loan for all types of reasons. People were confused. There was a lot of confusion around those loan products, um, whether they would be forgivable or not forgivable. And when you're a small business taking on a loan, when you have no idea what's going to happen and your future is uncertain, is definitely overwhelming. Um, the other thing that we have had a difficulty was getting people back to work. So once they did take the restrictions and allow us to go back to work with the proper PPE equipment, we did have difficulty getting people to return to work because of lack of childcare, lack of school being opened. Um, and so a lot of workers, you know, their lives were in, in a disarray. And so they were having trouble getting back uh, to the workforce. Hiring is a whole different game right now um, because getting like, you know, normally you could do a job fair or um, have a large, um, opportunity to invite the community in. So right now, again, when you're talking about direct laborers jobs, for example, those are going to be located in the community and we're not able to kind of go out and attract people. So we're trying to create new methods. I think that um, some sort of funding for small businesses to help them to market themselves to hire during the pandemic would be useful. Uh, that not having enough staff seems to be the number one problem in my industry, not being able to hire people that are trained to do the work. Um, and so I think the pandemic has heightened that, hopefully. Um, and then the other thing, again, agree, I agree um, that small businesses often have difficulty when they have a new idea and they wanna get something off the ground and expand and grow. Oftentimes, because we are small businesses, people are not willing to go out on a limb right away and support that growth. But we are you know, really economic drivers. We do hire people um, and grow local workforce uh, very rapidly. It's, it's a huge economic driver, small business. Thanks. And Jessica, I know that you commented during your presentation a bit on COVID impacts on the communities you're working with, but I'll give you an opportunity if you had anything else you wanted to add. 
Not really. Uh, the adaptation work has certainly ground to a halt. Um, Azavia also applied for a PPP loan. We were successful, thank goodness. Um, hiring is a whole different game uh, in technology in, in its own, but uh, post-COVID is uh, very much different. Um, I would just say that uh, we have a, as a B Corp, one of the things that we use our space for is a lot of community engagement and that is not happening right now. So a lot of the uh, nonprofits that we work with locally in Philadelphia have no place to meet, which is particularly hard for us, um, but we are not returning to the office anytime soon. Well, that is a really good segue into our next question, which is kind of about how your businesses interact with your local communities. Um, so I'm wondering if you could each speak a little bit more to both the work that you do with the local community in which you're situated in, as well as the communities uh, that you work with um, all over the country. And if you could speak to how small businesses position, uh, are well positioned um, to interact with communities and any specific examples you have of that. And maybe Jessica, we'll, we'll jump back to you on that and then we can go to Leticia and Stuart. Sure. So we have a couple of different communities that we're really active in. Obviously, our local community in Philadelphia is one that we work with a lot. Um, uh, we host a lot of uh, after hours meetings and uh, meetups and a lot of kind of um, uh, coding academies uh, for specific interest areas. Uh, we do a lot of that. Um, we also have a longstanding relationship with the Philadelphia Water Department and the Sustainability Office in Philadelphia, which we're lucky enough to have. So we are uh, kind of on the circuit, as it were, for a lot of those environmental um, uh, activities, and we, we pride ourselves on that. Uh, we're also, the other community that I'd say that we're pretty heavily involved in is the open source community. Uh, as, a, as a technology organization, we uh, really do believe in kind of making things open and freely accessible. Uh, we host a number of um, kind of technology exchanges and things like that. Um, we also just, one of the other uh, products that we have just hosted a, a data labeling conference uh, for creating machine learning training data sets and we had worldwide participation and it was uh, it was fantastic yes specifically since everyone is stuck at home we decided that it would be a good time to to use that <laughs> uh, to use the opportunity to engage them online which was really great and we got a lot of great feedback um, so uh, we're constantly looking for opportunities and our our CEO Robert Cheatham, uh, we joke that he knows everyone everywhere and uh, he's been really great at kind of making sure that everyone in the organization really tries to find opportunities to engage with the community at whatever level they're working. Leticia, we can go to you next. So um, Energy Efficiency Solutions, we partner with um, nonprofit organizations, and one of the ones we, prop we, we work with is Green Eagle Warriors. And this organization, what we do is we go out into um, at-risk vulnerable populations and communities of color and provide energy, environmental, and leadership education. So our goal really is to raise awareness in communities about the connections between energy, how it's generated, how we use it, or how we don't use it and use less of it, impacts everything from our economy and our health um, and, and the environment. And so these are concepts that have been historically missed uh, with youth and with minority populations. And so um, right now, again, with COVID, it's been a, a little more difficult. And so we've actually moved to a lot of online engagement, um, online book readings, and we're posting free content everywhere, providing it to public schools as well. We actually have um, a big um, opportunity coming up here to a bunch of inner city public schools. Actually, we're providing free uh, educational content and books to them because so many kids are at home and they don't have the learning resources that they need. Um, and earlier, you know, um, in uh, Jessica's presentation, she mentioned, um, you know, climate change information and how non-digestible it is. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we take really large, complicated topics and break them down to a fourth grade reading level. That is what we are best at. And so we find that um, when you break something down to a fourth grade reading level, not only are you engaging the child, but you end up actually engaging the entire family because kids are 
really good at driving home a message. Um, so that's really our uh, community engagement. I always think of Smokey the Bear or even the little gecko from Geico. Once you get a cute little character and a kid gets attached to it, they're just going to make the parents crazy until they go turn off the lights and you know, unplug the TVs and um, thinking about how we use energy, especially during a pandemic when everything is online. So we have this whole, um, you know, switch it off campaign. Uh, we're trying to defeat the Phantom Draw, who in our comic book series is an actual literal character who listens in through your uh, television and your cell phone and, you know, is meddling uh, with the world through energy use, trying to steal all of the power for himself. And so the kids get to battle that um, by stopping that waste of energy and defeating the Phantom Draw while they save energy and save De Niro, who is our hero character, by the way. So um, it's a lot of fun to work with the community. I think that it's what I, I love the most. I know that my teams, we give out our comic books at every um, home we go to, and it's really good to see the kids get engaged and the parents get engaged as well. Um, so that that's the way that we've kind of kept that going during the pandemic is through the tools and the online platforms. But we really miss that face-to-face -face going to schools with our characters, you know, putting on these live presentations and having the kids yell and scream, you know, um, the, that I can't wait for those days to come back. So, thanks so much. And I think that uh, connects really well with some of the presentations we had earlier in Workforce Wednesdays on um, some really innovative programs going on in high schools uh, to really reach students about these key issues. So, uh, thanks for your work on that. That's super interesting. Uh, Stuart, over to you. That's a tough act to follow. I'm not gonna not gonna lie. <laughs> So we don't have any uh, exciting superheroes uh, 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 in you know comic books, but um, we are uh, you know we work with government policymakers um, in the states we're active in. Obviously, we're headquartered in Portland, Maine. So we're um, you know there there's a climate council and a climate climate policy setting um, in the state, and we're active participants in that. Um, there's also technology innovation groups that we're active with there, uh, like MTI and CEI. And then um, we obviously, uh, you know, for a lot of our work, we hire local firms. So if we're, um, you know, with testing a device, um, we typically are going to hire main base consultants to help us with that. Um, we'll typically test our devices at, you know, the, the, the tanks at University of Maine or University of New Hampshire. Or if we're going out into the ocean, um, you know, we're going to hire uh, local uh, mariners to uh, um, you know to hire boats and and make and you know help us with our deployments and, and testing our devices. So, um, and then obviously on the remote community side, um, you know we get we get very actively involved. I mean we have a we have a weekly call with with the village of Igiagig um, as we've been going through this uh, DOE project, and it's obviously um, a major change in how um, their community is going to function with. Uh, Going from a diesel-based generation where you're flying in diesel fuel, and to uh, to a um, you know having that right there in the river, and and so um, you know working through all the issues um, that have arisen, you know we 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 have a lot of outreach to them, and again the weekly call help, helps make sure communication is uh, our lines of communication are strong. Great. Uh, so our next question dives a little bit more into the skills that you're looking for in um, the clean energy and climate resilience workforce. So what skills do you think are necessary for people that are looking to work in energy efficiency, renewable energy, or climate resilience? And what resources are out there for people who are looking to build those skills beyond traditional education systems? And I'll just make this a free for all, uh, whoever wants to jump in first. I mean, I think the energy efficiency industry is so broad that it's hard to define every skill that is needed for the many type of jobs that are out there. But um, <clears throat> an understanding of energy systems as they relate to buildings is an important part of energy efficiency um, training. The basic understanding where your energy comes from and how it's utilized in a building and how um, you know, 
like things like heat rise, for example, or the size of a building versus the size of an HVAC system. Lighting things are important. And understanding health barriers is another large growing issue in the United States. Um, health barriers being like asbestos, vermiculite, mold, um, and other um, issues in the buildings all across our nation that have to be addressed prior to making these deeper retrofitted upgrades. Um, that's, that's something that is a growing area of knowledge that's needed. Um, training on basic skills such as customer service. And surprisingly, this sometimes sounds silly, but something like how to use email or a tablet. Um, everything is so much more technical, and um, by technical, I mean computerized nowadays. So back in the day, uh, if you wanted to work in the industry, you probably just needed to know how to use an insulation machine, maybe a drill and a hammer. Now you're going to have to put all types of data sets into tablets and tools to create reports. Um, that track information on energy demand reduction. So um, I think that one of the needs that we really need is to have defined uh, places in each state where people can receive this type of workforce training so that we can really ramp up the hiring. Um, if there was an area that people could go to through a jobs funnel or a workforce program and pick and choose which certifications they need, which like in my career, for example, you could be trained in less than three months and make 20 bucks an hour or more. Um, these are real, really great jobs for people who need employment right away. Um, but if we don't have the training centers or the training um, material in place or the funds to send people to training, then it makes it hard to hire. Um, I'd say for us, it's a, it's a variety of, of, of skill sets. So I think overriding all of those is just a, um, you know, a passion for improving people's lives through um, bringing renewable energy solutions. So um, I, I, I think um, everybody who works at ORPC is pretty passionate about our mission and, and where we're headed and the impact we can have on the communities that we are reaching out to. Um, but, you know, it runs in terms of skill set. I mean, there's you know, background in environmental sciences. So you're, you know, when you're talking to communities, you can understand the the issues and 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 what they're working on. There's, um, you know, we're manufacturing devices, so some skill sets around understanding supply chains and and how parts are made and who can make them. Um, there's obviously permitting and approvals that need to be done at the state, local, and federal level. So, um, you know, skill sets in that line of work are are attractive to us as well. And then obviously engineering, whether it's, you know, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, you know, fluid dynamics, things like that. So um, we have a pretty wide skill set of, of, of people when we, you know, depending on the role we're looking to fill, um, it can, the cr criteria can move all over the place. What we're seeing in the communities that we work with that are trying to get adaptation plans together or vulnerability assessments together is that they would much rather rely on an adaptation planner. And there are, there are a few programs throughout the country. Uh, however, I would say that the best resource is the American Society for Adaptation Professionals. They have a host of resources and the executive director there is fantastically well networked. Um, and I would say that we're seeing the need increase tenfold. Uh, a lot of people just don't have the confidence to interpret some of this data. Uh, like Leticia was saying, if you can distill a concept down to something as simple as a, a cartoon character, which obviously is an oversimplification, but you still need the confidence uh, to know that you're conveying the right kind of information. And I think that uh, a lot of the communities that we are working with would much rather work with someone who has both a, uh, you know, the proclivity to understand some of the climate change indicators and to work with them to figure out what the policy changes should be. So we're, we're seeing a need for that bridge pretty much everywhere. Great, thank you all for commenting on that. Um, so I think we have time for one last question here. Um, so I'm gonna pick the, the most challenging one, maybe. Um, so uh, we've had the privilege of having a presentation today focused on energy efficiency, another one on a renewable energy source, and another one on climate resilience. So I'm wondering if you could speak to kind of how these two major areas of addressing climate change come together in your business. So I'm thinking in energy efficiency, maybe we're seeing more hot days in Connecticut. So how are we kind of thinking about 
adaptation built in with energy efficiency. And then in the case of marine renewable energy and remote communities, Alaska's facing uh, pretty rapid erosion along the coastlines. And so kind of how does that build into your thinking as you're developing your small business work in these areas? And Jessica, of course, uh, any thoughts you have on putting together adaptation mitigation and data communication to these small communities that you serve um, that are, you know, trying to work with uh, very limited personnel capacity to to address these big challenges. Um, so maybe Leticia, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I just did a piece on NPR actually about the demands for air conditioning, the growing demands worldwide for air conditioning and its impacts on climate and climate emissions. And it's for me, I've always connected those things. I actually come from a healthcare background. And the reason I got into energy efficiency was I learned in 2009 about climate change and the impacts of burning coal. Believe it or not, I didn't know about this before that. I come from a community that we don't talk about climate change and definitely I had no idea where my electricity came from. So when I learned about that, I was terrified that I wasn't doing anything to stop this thing that was going to kill my whole community and everyone I knew. Um, and so it transitioned into this energy efficiency world. And as I've watched it uh, since 2009 change so rapidly our environment and I see the impacts that are happening um, in communities that are vulnerable and at risk, sea level rise. I mean, this is a very serious problem. Uh, the health impacts of water and air pollution that relate to energy usage, they all directly relate. And then, you all things are connected right if you're a scientist all things are connected anyways and one input you know equals another output so as we draw down our demand for heating and cooling needs and we draw down our demand for electricity uh, usage and more importantly we lower the cost per kilowatt hour as we draw down peak demand and as we build up our renewable resources um, what happens is it actually lowers the cost of meeting that zero carbon goal so drawing down demand makes it easier to ramp up renewables because it makes it less costly to ramp up renewables because you're using less of them. Um, likewise, heating and cooling will cost less. And so you're sizing a system that's more effective and you can turn it over to electrification if you deal with your thermal boundaries. And so all things are truly connected. Um, I think that this is why I think education is such an important component of all of this, um, especially simple education for the layman and the common person who does not work in energy, renewable efficiency or sustainability, because so many people are having the difficulty of making that connection, understanding that, you know, having that light on your computer, on your TV, on going to work, driving all these things that they're actually connected to the outputs of the world that we live in and you know, in my opinion, as a building scientist directly related to also climate emissions. So um, although that may sound risky, if if we don't, you know, worry about climate change, that's okay too, because either way, it's still driving down the cost of our energy and still building our economy. And so I say there's really no need to argue about it because using less of something that is expensive is always a good choice. So less is more when it comes to energy demand. And in the case of renewables, having more of a renewable resource is good because then we can share it across the grid or create microgrids um, as we heard earlier. Hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Stuart, we can go to you next and then we'll give Jessica the last word. Sure, I think there's, um... You know, I think of resiliency is the is the is the real challenge for a lot of these communities, and um, I certainly think remote communities, as they look, a lot of their cultures go back, you know, five thousand, ten thousand years, and it's only a short window where they become, you know, beholden to fossil fuels. And so I think there's a an interest in moving away from that and getting back to a sustainable type of, uh, you know. They, they want the, the electricity that, that the modern world brings, but without, without the impact. And they're, they're seeing the impact, you know, more than anyone. Um, and then if you think about some of the coastal communities on the, on the East Coast, you know, there's discussions of, um, you know, building, um, uh, you know, flood, flood prevention systems. And, uh, you know, that's, that's water moving in and out. Um, and, you know, I think there's opportunities there to put, um, devices there that could generate electricity. So not only providing barriers to prevent flooding, but use those as a basis to uh, to provide uh, electricity as well. 
for the communities that we work with, I think um, both visualization, education, and outreach are critical. Uh, this climate change data is incredibly hard to visualize. Um, and we've tried a number of things. Uh, <laughs> some things stick, some things don't. It depends on the community. It depends on what the future is going to look like and feel like for them. What we've seen is the most successful way to engage a community is to make it real and tangible and talk to them about things that happened in recent memory. Uh, do you remember Sandy? Do you remember Irene? You know, this, these are the things that happened. What happened? How did we, how did we recover? What's going to happen the next time? an Irene or a Sandy comes through and we have to uh, rebuild after that. Uh, that starts the conversation about resilience and can um, get through some of the barriers about the hypotheticals about climate change data. Obviously, the further out you go in the projections, we have projections to 2100, the lower the confidence level we have in those projections. So you don't necessarily want to jump to the most extreme potential future. You want to kind of ground it in. Here's what you were already seeing. Let's talk about what the future might hold. Uh, being able to distill that in a really easily and accessible way and have that conversation on equal ground is, uh, I think, incredibly powerful. And I think um, equity plays a huge role in climate change adaptation. And unfortunately, because these communities are already so budgetarily strapped, they have sometimes limited uh, resources and time to do some of that outreach, but it's so critical. Uh, I think if we could figure out a way to increase the funding and opportunities for those people to engage online now, I guess, uh, since we can't have kind of large town halls and things like that. But I think that is one of the biggest barriers to, to really um, picking up steam and moving a little bit faster. Well, thanks, Jessica, for um, having the last word. And you mentioned uh, Sandy and Irene and a few other names, Storms. Well, I guarantee that anybody who watched us today will remember Leticia, Stewart, and Jessica, uh, because you gave great presentations and uh, shared lots of great information with our audience today. And um, what a great way to wrap up Workforce Wednesdays. Uh, so thank you very much for taking time out of your day and for joining us. Uh, it was great to get to know you um, and, um, and learn a lot as well. Um, this is where we wrap it up, um, and uh, I just want to say thanks to Anna for helping me moderate today. Um, also, like to thank Omri and Dan O'Brien and Hamilton and Joseph and the comms and the policy teams and everyone uh, at ESI who's able to make um, these online briefings happen and, uh, and do it in a way that makes them really interesting and, and accessible, so thanks for everyone's effort. Um, this slide is, uh, has a couple links on it. Um, one is where you can get all of the resources after the fact. Everything will be made available online. Um, we would also really appreciate if you would take a moment to take our survey. Um, www.esi.org forward slash survey. We read all of the responses you submit. Uh, we take the responses very seriously and we're always looking for ways to improve whether it's on the technical side of things or a content side of things or format side of things we really appreciate all the feedback you're able to provide um, so thanks in advance for doing that um, and we'll go ahead and end it there sorry for running a couple minutes late but i think everyone will agree with me that it was well worth it uh, because we had such amazing presenters today so thanks everyone i hope uh, you have a great rest of your Wednesday, uh, and be sure to sign up online for our newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every other Tuesday. The most recent issue was yesterday, and uh, it's the best way to stay informed about all of our all of the goings on at ESI. So until next time, uh, not the, not next Workforce Wednesday because this is five out of five, but the next time we're online, which is a little ways away. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Hope everyone stays safe and takes care. And thanks so much for joining us.